So if you'll please uh, remain muted and have your, your phones silenced. I would like to introduce Jane Brockman, who will introduce our speaker and our session for today. Thank you. Can I use this? Mm -hmm. um, well, welcome to uh, the session on uh, the course on uh, model organisms. As uh, Julie just said, I'm Jane Brockman, and I'll be the facilitator of this for the next few weeks. Um, these model organisms are uh, had a sort of inordinate influence over uh, our understanding of biology. Um, many of the sort of fundamental principles of biology have come from model organisms, but we often don't know anything about them. Um, in fact, in some cases, people rep do uh, reports that don't even say what species they're working on. So I thought it would be interesting to uh, learn some things about uh, model organisms and uh, their importance and why they're being used and so forth. Um, and so uh, the first of our speakers is um, my friend and colleague, uh, Marta Wayne. Uh, Dr. Wayne received her PhD from Princeton and uh, then uh, went to a postdoc at uh, North Carolina, University of North Carolina. And she came to um, University of Florida in 1998, worked her way up through the ranks, um, ultimately became department chair of biology, uh, which she held for eight years, bless her heart, <laughs> did a great job. And um, she stepped down from that position in 21 and has recently taken up a position of um, the Dean of International Studies and uh, Associate Provost. Yeah. Um, so uh, today she will be talking about, she's a, she's a very busy woman, so I'm really grateful that she was able to come and talk to us about um, her old friends, Drosophila. Thank you so Good much, advice. Jane. Okay. So is it okay if I walk around the room? Oh, good, because standing in one place is boring for the audience and me. I'm just going to fool around with this remote for a moment and make sure I know what it's doing. All right, cool. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to say is that this this is a lovely photograph of a Mediterranean fruit fly, which is only distantly related to Drosophila melanogaster. Um, so Drosophila melanogaster is a sweet caramel colored animal that does not attack fruit and does not cause any trouble to anybody. Medflies are a major crop pest, which is why you have this picture of this beautiful animal on citrus, of which it is a major pest in California. Oh, cool. Thank you. All right, ta -da. So, oh, okay, is everybody, is everybody good with the sound? Let's start with that, yeah? Okay, so why do people use model organisms? Um, one reason is that often we like to learn by moving from simpler organisms to more complex ones. And I've always found this particular description confusing when I think about fruit flies because I don't know about you, but I couldn't walk on six legs and move wings at the same time. So I think fruit flies are reasonably complicated, but I can also appreciate that from our human centric point of view, they are simpler. Um, they certainly have simpler physiology and other things. So a lot of times if we can understand basic principles in simple organisms or simple, in, simple models, simple anything, then we can elaborate and add more detail and more complexity as we go. So that's one reason people like model organisms. But the most important reason is that there are some experiments we simply cannot do in the organisms in which we are interested. So for example, if we want to understand the genetics of a human disease, we can't do a lot of the traditional breeding techniques, like we cannot have sibling matings, nor yet can we say, all right, please mate with your brother and produce 14 offspring. So there are sample size issues as well as many ethical issues. Um, so for the, in addition, we can't do experiments in humans that are, that are going to be harmful to humans. So we cannot induce cancer. So we cannot um, try to inbreed for particular genes that would cause some sort of genetic difficulty. These are all great reasons why we need to have model systems 
where we can study the things that we're interested in for humans in a, in a context that is ethically acceptable. So the properties of a good model organism would be a short generation time. This is another reason that we can't always study the organisms we're interested in. If we want to study uh, sequoias, for example, we can't wait for that long generation time. It, it would just be infeasible. So we have short generation time plants instead. And if we wanted to know something about whales or even humans for that matter, we need to have something with a shorter generation time. Otherwise it would be my grandchild um, hopefully still interested in the work I was doing, 0% probability, um, who would be solving the problems. Another thing we need is small size. In order to have confidence in the conclusions that we derive, we want to have large sample sizes so that any kind of random variation or environmental effects can be accounted for. So in order to have large sample sizes, we want something that we can grow lots of in a very small space. In addition, we need to be able to raise them in captivity. Some things are not amenable to uh, rearing in captivity, including some of our more interesting bacteria. There are a lot of, lot of fun pathogens we would love to study, but we can't grow them in laboratory conditions. They need to be fecund. They need to have lots of offspring. So fruit flies are very fecund. And they need to have, at least at the time people started thinking about these things, a small genome. So a small genome means that it's going to be much easier to assign a function to genes than something horribly huge and complicated. And it's also useful to have background knowledge. So if we know something about the organism, and this is a point I'll come back to a couple of times, we can move forward faster. So Drosophila melanogaster has a generation time, 10 to 14 days is pretty typical. 14 is convenient. You'll notice that's two weeks. That means we don't have to go into the lab on a weekend. Yay. And small size, if you have a vial about that big, I can put hundreds of flies in that vial. They can easily be raised in captivity. In fact, I imagine some of you raise fruit flies um, without wanting to in captivity. Um, I can talk to you about the best fruit fly trap ever if you need help with that afterwards. And they are very fecund. So one female can lay over 100 eggs in her lifespan. And of course, their genome is about 25 times smaller than the humans. We can talk about whether that's actually less complex or not. That's a different question. And as far as background knowledge goes, there are decades of research and tools in Drosophila. And those tools are one of the things that make Drosophila so valuable. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on these, but I'll just talk about some briefly. So for background knowledge, here we have uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan and his students, um, Sturdivant, Bridges, and Muller, who were working in Columbia University in 1901. These are some of the people who pioneered the use of Drosophila. It was also studied um, at Bryn Mawr uh, by Nettie Stevens about the same time they were starting to use Drosophila as well, and a few other places. But this is, the, this is considered the founding of fruit fly knowledge. And so you can see, whoops, that's not what I was trying to do. Oh man, okay, laser. So here is Thomas Hunt Morgan working with, um, in this case, fruit flies are in milk bottles. So old fashioned pint sized milk bottles. And if you look at this list, you'll note that um, Morgan and Mueller both went on to get the Nobel Prize separately for their work on flies. And Sturdivant um, got the, uh, National Medicine, National Medal for Medical Sciences, but not a Nobel Prize. And Bridges is the only one who didn't get any honoraria. So you can see this was a really rarefied atmosphere. And these people were united by their passion in the light of the rediscovery of Mendel. So Mendel, of course, was active a long time ago, but people had rediscovered him around the turn of the, 19, uh, the, turn of the century, between 1800 and 1900. And so people were really excited about genetics again. They thought, well, maybe there's a way to understand what's actually going on. And this is part of what was motivating Morgan and his students to start studying fruit flies. They recognized the power of a model system. And Morgan, of course, had his history as an evolutionary biologist. So that gave him a leg up. And they thought if we could only find genetic variations, mutations in these little fruit flies, then we might be able to study them. 
because we'd be able to do lots of crosses and get lots of offspring and who knows where this will lead. I'm pointing the wrong way. So one of the things that they learned that was incredibly important is that genes are carried on chromosomes. Now this may seem so old and trivial as to be meaningless, but at the time it was a really big deal that genes were carried on chromosomes, that their order on the chromosome was fixed. They always occur, you know, this one next to this one next to this one. And the way this was done, so these are fruit flies, and you can see they look pretty similar. The female lacks the solid abdomen that the male has, but other than that, they're hard to tell apart. They're tiny, so they're perhaps trying to think of something that's the size of a fruit fly, smaller than a grain of rice. And the first mutation that Morgan found was an animal, a male that had white eyes. And he was really excited, and he set this male up with lots of, of females and waited and waited because the mutations are no good if they're not passed on to the next generation. We're not going to be able to study them. And so one of the humorous anecdotes that's been handed down, possibly apocryphally, is that he called his wife in childbirth and said, Lydia, we have flies. The white fly has progeny. Great. Back to pushing. So I don't know if this is true. It's a good story. But it did turn out that these, the white-eyed animal had offspring. And what was interesting about this is they saw that they were inherited in a Mendelian way. So they keep breeding. We've got a three-to-one ratio. Everything looks great, except the white-eyed flies kept being male. What's going on here? So that is, this is the idea that led to the discovery of XY chromosomes being related to sex determination. And that they and this pattern that because males have only one X chromosome, anything any mutation on the X, we're much more likely to see in males. So for example, if anyone in this room were colorblind, I would I would bet good money that it is one of the males in the room. Um, I used to ask this question in genetics, but now I know that we don't ask people to raise their hands if they're colorblind anymore. But it was always fun because when there's a room full of, with over a hundred people. You would almost always get one, and they'd almost always, but not always, be men. So that is, that's a basic way that people were able to find that genes were carried on chromosomes. And that discovery led to the study of crossing over, so how we have recombination, how we get different combinations of genes in the offspring, um, and, a number, and genetic mapping as well. So how many of you have a background in genetics of any kind? How about a... Ken, <laughs> you must be asleep. Okay, how many of you have a background in uh, medicine of any kind? Okay, now you're just lying. Okay, so people who are studying these, um, trying to understand human traits, often do these studies called genome-wide association studies. And this is a way of figuring out where all the genes are for, let's say, heart disease. And you use huge numbers of people and huge numbers of sequences and all their medical history. And that technique, which is um, probably 15 years old now, maybe, was developed directly from these ideas of genetic mapping and fruit flies that were discovered in the 1910s. One of the most important breakthroughs that fruit flies led to is actually a technical one, and that is whole genome sequencing. So people were interested in this new sequencing method that was massively parallel and therefore very fast. It had only been done in a virus. I think it was cauliflower mosaic virus. And so people wondered, well, could that possibly be applied to animals? And at this time, there were proposals for a human genome project, a very radical proposal by Francis Collins. We're going to have a human, human genome in 15 years. We threw a huge number of resources at this project. And a lot of people thought it was going to be useless or that it couldn't be done. And so that's why there was a lot of interest in these new sequencing methods. And so the method that was under consideration is called shotgun sequencing. Basically, you randomly destroy the genome. You just break it up into many, many, many tiny pieces. You throw all those pieces into one tube, and you sequence them. And you have no, and in doing this, you completely lose the structure of the genome. So all of the order has been destroyed. At the end, you have lots and lots of little bits, and you have so many that there are overlapping sequences. So you figure, then you have to reconstruct the genome by looking at the areas of overlap. And the idea here is that because you 
throw all the pieces into one tube, you can do this a lot faster than classic sequencing, which worked by breaking a genome into ordered fragments and sequencing each fragment independently. But then, of course, you know the order they go in. So the only reason that this was feasible is because there was a huge increase in computational power. So at the same time that Francis Collins is leading a multinational collaboration to get the human genome sequenced, someone came along and said, I'm going to try the shotgun sequencing and I'm going to blow you guys out of the water. This, this someone is called Craig Venter. And so a race began. And by sequencing Drosophila melanogaster in, the, in 2000, Venter demonstrated that the shotgun approach could be used in a multicellular organism for the first time. So personal anecdote, I was at the, at the fly meeting, because of course we have a national meeting for Drosophila research every year. And when we walked into the first plenary session on every single chair in the auditorium was a CD with the Drosophila melanogaster genome. That was like the coolest thing ever that you could, you would sit down and you're like holding the genome of your organism. So the fir first model organism genome ever done. It was really neat. In 2001, the next year, the draft sequence of the human genome was produced. And there were two different papers one from Francis Collins Consortium in Nature, and the other with the shotgun sequencing technique developed by Craig Venter in science, or not developed by, but implemented by Craig Venter. The human genome, and this was a draft, so there were lots of holes and so on, but the human genome project got completed faster because of the pressure of the competition. So a classic story of competition, if you are interested at all in patenting, and how these things can drive advances. Now, of course, sequencing a new genome is so de rigueur that you can't even get a PhD for sequencing a new genome. And so a lot of people thought, well, now that you can sequence anything, model organisms are going to go out the window. So why should I, if I want to study koala bears, why am I going to study them in fruit flies? Well, the answer is because the other properties of model organisms are still relevant. You need to be able to have large numbers. You need to be able to rear them under controlled conditions. And they need to have rational generation times. So we still need model organisms, despite, despite the excitement of being able to sequence pretty much anything we want. So another question is, why, why do model organisms work? So how is it that we can actually learn something about humans from a fruit fly? There's a very important assumption that underlies the use of all model organisms, and that is shared ancestry. So this is all about Darwin's theory of a common ancestor and descent with modifications. Because of that, we share lots of genes with fruit flies and with many other animals, as well as even with some plants. When I mentioned that Morgan was an evolutionary biologist, this is where it came into play, is because it was implicit to him that there was shared ancestry. And so that if genes were on chromosomes in fruit flies, they were probably on chromosomes and everything else too. After sequencing the fly genome, we learned that about 60% of all genes, including 75% of the known disease genes at the time, have a homolog in fruit flies. What's a disease gene? Well, most genes, if you break them, will cause some sort of disease. You know, generally speaking, if you have something functional and you break it at random, it doesn't work, right? But when we talk about disease genes, we are thinking about genes that have been mapped to where there are alleles, that is, variants on them that cause a particular gene like cystic fibrosis or something like that. There's a particular syndrome associated with it. So most of the disease genes that are already been mapped for humans have a homolog, and a homolog just means an, an ancestral copy in fruit flies. So we were able to do a lot of exciting study. And this led to the quote from Jerry Rubin, flies are just people with wings. I love this quote, it's brilliant. And the whole idea is that, well, yeah, you know, we've got all these shared genes, all we have to do is study the flies and we'll learn all about people. So there is a little bit more to this. So let's talk for a little bit about what, what does it mean that we think of flies as people with wings? So flies and fly geneticists enjoy giving mutations particular names. And fly people like to give mutations names that have meaning that reflects something about the gene that's being affected. 
So for example, if I'm in a particularly nerdy mood, I will tell people that I'm homozygous for the cheap date mutation. What that means, I can't metabolize alcohol well. There is indeed a mutation in fruit flies called cheap date. Um, this is where this comes from. As I said, very dorky mood, okay? But there are a lot of funny names and it makes it easy to remember the phenotype because they have these names. So anybody want to guess about the phenotype of the Canon Barbie mutation? Hmm? No, something else. Close, closer. Ken and Barbie, she said sexy. Jane said long neck. It's not either of those, but sexy was closer. So it turns out they have no external genitalia. So these, these jokes are all cute and they're fun and they help us remember things. But that nomenclature is culturally and temporally specific. So, you know, if you don't know what a Barbie doll is, this is not going to work for you. You're not going to be able to remember this. And in addition, you know, the way that we use words and what we think is appropriate changes with time. Plus, all these things started out being named in English. And I can remember there was um, consternation when there were mutations that started coming out with German names because of Christian Nusslein Fullhard, who's German, another winner of a Nobel Prize for her work in fruit flies. And she was naming fruit fly mutations things like Spetzel. Um, okay, we, most of us know what Spetzel is, but they got more arcane. So why does this matter? Because science is supposed to be objective. And at the same time, we all know that scientists are products of our cultures. So I'm going to tell you another story about a mutational name where it, I can hope to illustrate the point that sometimes the names are not helpful. So in 1963, there was a mutation discovered called fruity. And if you look carefully here, you'll see a stream of fruit flies. And these guys are all males and they are courting each other. Fruit flies court by, they walk up to you and they sing. Males sing, females don't sing. And then they orient and they do these very stereotypical dances. And if they think they're getting somewhere, then they start approaching from the rear instead of from the front. If the female doesn't like them, she kicks them in the head. Um, but if she does like them, she doesn't do anything, she just hangs out. So here you can see we've got a whole bunch of, whoops, male fruit flies following each other along. And so in 1963, they called this fruity, which was, a, um, which was later described as a pejorative word for male homosexual. In 1978, some researchers decided that it would be better to call it fruitless because that got away from this pejorative term. And it described the, to them the observation that the fly's courtship was fruitless and that it was not going to produce progeny. This also, however, suggested that the flies were always sterile which is not true. In addition, people later discovered that there were many, many mutations of the gene called fruity. And they're all a little bit different from one another. But in most cases, if you have females, it's not so much that males prefer other males. It's that they're completely non-discriminate. They'll just, you know, they'll court anything that crosses their path. And regular fruit flies don't do this. These guys do. So neither of these names is particularly useful if we're trying to talk about scientific accuracy. So what does this thing actually do? Well, this is a good scientific mouthful. Sex-specific splice variant in a transcription factor. What that means is that the gene that causes this change in behavior is something that binds with DNA and causes the expression of other genes. Which form is present to bind to the DNA depends on whether you're male or female. If you have the male variant, you do male things. And if you have the female variant, you do female things. You can already see in the way that I'm talking about this that there's still plenty of cultural information tied up here, like the concept of maleness and femaleness. But we're getting closer. So model organisms are indeed amazing. So I want to come back to some of the really fun things we've done. And the best thing about model organisms, in addition to developing techniques like the sequencing that led to the Human Genome Project, is that they provide model systems for understanding complicated human diseases. For example, cancer. So colorectal cancer, almost all colorectal cancers that occur sporadically are caused by a defect in the Wnt pathway. Wnt is short for wingless. 
These supplies that did not have wings contained a mutation in a particular gene wingless, which is involved in cell proliferation. By understanding that, people were able to make the jump to understanding what this, what this gene was that was causing colorectal cancer. In addition, glioblastomas, which are a type of brain tumor, are controlled by signaling from a gene called NOTCH. NOTCH is a mutation discovered in fruit flies because they had a notch out of the end of their wing. And this one is also involved in whether or not cells multiply and regenerate in a controlled or an uncontrolled manner. In addition, there are important fruit fly genes involved in immunology. If you ever hear words like toll, that's a fly gene. In Parkinson's, that one has a particularly unromantic fly name because that gene was actually identified first in something else. And by understanding these genes, we can learn about the pathways that cause disease. We can understand what the causative mutations are so we could contemplate things like gene therapy or gene editing. And we can evaluate particular treatments. So we can try different drugs, different compounds in fruit flies and see if they work prior to moving to a mammalian system or ultimately an animal system, uh, ultimately a human system. And finally, my take home message is always the same. Basic science is essential. So Morgan started studying fruit flies because he wanted to understand about genetics as described by a Bavarian monk who likes sweet peas. That led to the Human Genome Project. That leads to understanding drugs that can treat us for a lot of different things. Without that basic science, we wouldn't have these models and we wouldn't have all this information. So basic science is incredibly important to the progress of science and applied science, as well as the advancement of technology. So thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions, have a discussion, whatever would make you guys happy. So any questions? Thank you so much. Uh, I had no idea what we owed to fruit flies. So thank you for presenting that today. You are most welcome. I always enjoyed, um, if you guys remember Nancy Palin, or that's not her first name, is it? Sarah Palin, talking about the crisis of fruit fly research in Paris. Can you believe it? This is for real. But she was not actually talking about our fruit flies. She was talking about a, diff a crop pest fruit fly. But it was still fun. I'm, I'm just curious, what made Morgan decide to look at fruit flies back in 1900? Because of all those categories, because they knew they could rear them easily in the lab. And they were small and they could get lots and lots and lots of them. And because of that short generation time. So if you wanted to try to recreate Mendel's experiments and you didn't want to use sweet peas, you wanted to do it in an animal because you wanted to understand something about how humans worked. What better animal than a fruit fly? Oh, okay, that's a good question too. Okay, that totally makes sense. So the nice thing about fruit flies is they eat a very simple diet in the lab. It's cornmeal, agar, and molasses. It doesn't smell bad. It doesn't require meat. It doesn't smell bad. It smells very nice. Um, yeah, well, just, you know, it's just kelp protein. So it's, they're really simple to rear, and you don't have to go to great lengths. You don't have to contain them in any particular way. You just put them in these little tubes with cotton stoppers in them. So they're really, really, really simple. As mentioned before, I mean, you probably have all had the experience of accidentally breeding fruit flies in your trash can or your compost bucket or whatever. So this is, this is one of the reasons. Another species of fruit fly was being considered, and that was um, Pseudo obscura, but it has a four-week generation time instead of a two-week. Um, and it's very lucky for us that we did pick Melanogaster because it has a, its genome is less uh, complicated. So, Pseudo obscura is well known for having a lot of um, insertions and inversions. So if you imagine this is a, this is a chromosome, you take a piece of the chromosome out and flip it, that's an inversion. And Pseudo obscura is riddled with these, which are interesting in their own right, but would have made things very hard. Ms. Lynn, oh, Ken. Let me, let me just to follow up on that. What do they do under natural circumstances? What are they doing 
out in the wild? Well, that's, that's actually a very funny question as well. So oddly enough, we don't have a very good understanding of what fruit flies are doing in their natural habitat, at least this kind. So we don't know what they feed on. They're human commensals and have been for so long, we really don't understand their basic ecology. We know that they, um, we know that they can undergo diapause, which is sort of like insect hibernation, but not under the coldest of temperatures. So we know that they tend to repopulate to the north every year, but we don't really know much other than that. We know that they follow odor plumes, that they have wonderful senses of olfaction. We know that they're drawn to things that give off carbon dioxide. So if you want to catch your fruit flies, yeast, beer, coffee, wine, um, bananas, because bananas start fermenting quickly. Anything that gives off carbon dioxide will attract them um, over a long range. But in fact, we don't know much about them in the wild, which is a continuing frustration. So actually on Monday, I'm going to go into somewhat more detail about the genome sequencing issue. But I think a, a nice story is a Craig Venter, who is a kind of a contrary entrepreneurial type, had been at the NIH and had bailed out because the NIH was not interested in, uh, in patenting. In what? Patenting various um, sequences that yes. Craig was generating. So he wanted to go out on his own. So now you had a situation where Francis Collins and the NIH had essentially an unlimited amount of money to do the human genome. It was sort of like an A-bomb project. And, and Craig was out there using private money. And he really couldn't figure out a way to um, be ahead of. It's not on. It's on. I can hear. He couldn't figure out a good way to beat the NIH group. But yes. the NIH group, in fact, weren't doing very well. Nope, they were not. They spent a lot of money, bought a lot of big sequencing machines but weren't producing much sequence. And one night, uh, Craig ran into a fellow named Ham Smith in the bar at a meeting. Ham had already won the Nobel Prize for inv inventing recombinant DNA, essentially. And uh, he and Ham started drinking, and Ham said, actually, your problem is not difficult. We can use it. We, we can put together all these little pieces, random assortment, and make it work. Mm -hmm. And Craig said, well, if we can do that, we're off to the races, but we gotta, we got to start somewhere. Actually, it started with bacteria, did a Haemophilus strain. Yeah, Haemophilus as well. They sequenced. Yep. Uh, and then they, then they moved on to more complex things. But... Uh, so now you had this small group with private money competing with the government, and it was a very nasty competition. It was extremely unpleasant, yes. And, and finally, at the end, the president, who was Clinton at that time, brought them together at the White House, and they had a joint announcement of the human genome, but of course the poor government guys had had a race like crazy to try and catch up to Venter and Smith and Clyde Hutchinson, which they did. And so that was good. But you'll note that there's no Nobel Prize for having determined the human genome. And I think that's a reflection of the bitterness involved and it's it um, it was sort of reflected in later nobel prizes such as with uh, the discovery of hiv etc so that, that one also that, got kind that of ugly that plays that plays into uh, into uh, the awarding of the prize yeah absolutely there's a lot of very bad blood and bitter stories about that race um, 
And one of the interesting things about the Drosophila genome was that it was released without patent and for free to make a point, which was that Venter wasn't necessarily only interested in money. So it was very deliberate action to leave all those CDs on all of our, our chairs to try to get the support of scientists, um, many of whom, many of us, of course, being NIH funded. But yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And part of the race was because there was a concern that Venter would try to patent the whole thing. Um, which turned and patent law evolved in many interesting ways to stop that. One last observation. I'll just repeat so you don't have to run around, James. Well, the question is whose genome is it that was sequenced? You want to you want to share that? A little different. And so somebody's genome was actually the test genome. And the rumor is that Venter's genome was what they sequenced, and that Watson's yes. genome was what the NIH sequenced. Hard, it's hard to prove that, but it's that's pretty the, well that's substantiated. Yeah, nope, that's absolutely right. Two, two special individuals, let us say. I think that I'm pretty sure that Venter came out and said that was his, um, but Watson, you would have to get him to cough up a sample and perhaps he doesn't wish to. I don't know. Well, it's generally frowned upon to follow people around and correct their cells. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a question over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, so the, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the wingless fruit flies apparently led to advances in our understanding of um, colon diseases. Mm -hmm. um, so what about Parkinson's? You, you had a slide that showed Parkinson's and I was intrigued for obvious reasons in my family there was Parkinson's and you had it too. So the Parkinson's, there are a number of genes that are associated with Parkinson's. So there's familial Parkinson's and there's more environmental. And the fly model has been used to look at both and those, that gene I am less familiar with, and it doesn't have a cute name, so I don't have a story for it. The most, it has like alpha in the name or something like this. So it's the same idea, however, that because humans share genes with fruit flies, when people saw a Parkinson's-like phenotype in fruit flies, they were able to start understanding more about, well, can we find the gene that causes this in flies? Yes, we could. Does that gene have a homolog in humans? Well, it turns out it had already been characterized in mice or something like that. So yes, and then you're able to test various kinds of drugs. There are a lot of um, interesting mutations in flies that have similar phenotypes to Parkinson's. They're not all related. There's one, um, ether agogo, where if the flies are exposed to ether, they begin to move uncontrollably. Um, so there are a huge number of these, but yeah, it's the, it's the same idea that because we share the genes, and not just the genes, but the way those genes respond to the environment, that we can study Parkinson's and fruit flies and look for therapies. Yes, thank you, that is the one. Alpha synuclein, that is the gene. Oh, the question was, which part of the, the whole question? The question was, oh, okay. Wispa just said that the name of the gene is alpha centinin. Synuclein. Yes, it's alpha synuclein. But there are many, many genes involved in Parkinson's in humans and Parkinson's like phenotypes in flies. So understanding everything about that gene is not going to necessarily tell any individual in this room about risk for Parkinson's or prospects for treatments. Or in that room. So did I understand you correctly to say that um, for a lot of a lot of cancers today, they now have targeted gene therapies, right? No, we have the potential to do that. Okay. Targeted gene therapies in cancers are still extremely rare. Okay. There are very few of them. Um, so then the question is, is that you were commenting that, that some of the Drosophila genome is so similar that uh, we can tell the cancers. Um, so are they, is there research on gene targeting therapies in Drosophila? Yes, of course. Ah, cool. And in fact, that's one of the um, 
That's like the gold standard for do you know if the gene is doing whatever it is. You have to be able to knock it out and see the phenotype you want to see, and you have to be able to replace the knocked out version with a functional version um, in order to really believe that you found a causal mutation. And so, yes, that, that work is common in flies, and the most interesting work of that sort is, is actually in nematodes. They are good for something. Um, so with CRISPR, this concept of gene editing, which I'm sure you'll hear about, um, that was all discovered. Um, the CRISPR mechanism was discovered and really perfected in nematodes because you can just feed them their little edited constructs and they'll do their work. And if you want to get replacement in flies, you have to do a lot more fancy tricks. That's a pain is, in the neck. Is there anyone? Oh, um, so Phyllis, uh, up on the mute, um, unmute yourself, Phyllis, and um, and ask your question. As as a paleontology hobbyist, uh, I wonder if you have any sense of um, the common ancestor through which we seem to have shared these genes with an insect. So um, I can't give you a date. Jane might be better able to give you the date. But we're looking at the most recent common ancestor of all animals. So very, 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 very far back. And, and has anything been, I mean, really, it's just kind of speculation. What is the common ancestor at this point, I would suppose? Yes, it uh -huh. is definitely speculation. I mean, people have no idea, and I don't think we will ever know exactly what that, what that uh, common ancestor was at some level. Ken has a thought. He's waiting for his microphone. On Monday. We're going to talk about the Nobel Prize in Medicine, which was given to Svante Pabo last year. And Pabo got the prize for sequencing um, the genome of Neanderthal man. So that's about 500,000 years you can go back, or something in that range, 100 to 500,000 with DNA and try and figure that sort of thing out. And you can do paleontology with DNA sequencing, but you have these enormous gaps in between. And so developing a single tree uh, is, is rather challenging. Just doing the human tree back to Neanderthal turns out, and then they get back to chimpanzees and other uh, anthropoid apes, et cetera. And you try and figure out which one came off of the tree first. It's, a, it's kind of interesting in a way, but it tells you that we have a very long way to go if you want to go back even further. Well, if you guys are fans at all of Jurassic Park, then you'll know the story about how they so they found a mosquito in the amber and supposedly pulled the dinosaur DNA out. So that, that is still uh, impossible. Um, but people have been able to do really interesting studies doing genetic reconstructions and recreating extinct species, including mammoths and things like that. And some of the most interesting paleontology work um, involving humans, in, in my opinion, has been looking at infectious disease. So people were able to get viral RNA RNA out of the um, teeth cavities of people from the Bronze Age and identify when plague um, became pneumonic. That's fantastic, right? So we can actually date that, and then we can associate that with the archaeological evidence um, and talk about the effects of plague and when it spread. And, and Ken is just sitting there shaking his head. But I think it's lovely stuff. Turns out the mitochondrial DNA all comes from your mother. It's all maternal. Yeah. So that makes analysis much more straightforward. And the bottom line is, if you follow this back, is that all of us are related to five women who came out of Africa a hundred thousand years ago or so, and then spread out, branched out into Europe, et cetera. And I, I, to me, that's a kind of amusing story. Anyway, yeah, the relationship between 
flies in people is much, much further back than any of the things that we're discussing, of course, because that's prior to the emergence of animals as a, as a group. So very, very old. And yeah, and of course it's microbial except where, when, I mean, if you want to get a bunch of people really angry, get the early life people into a room and watch them fight it out. <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, Jane. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you a, a little, we have a few more minutes. Um, so uh, what sort of things did, were you doing with um, Drosophila? I know you've worked on viruses and you've worked on some other things, um, but uh, where did your research take you? And I know you um, occasionally worked on other species of Drosophila. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, I was just curious what sort of things you had, you had been doing. Well, I started out, um, being curious about, I started out working in evolutionary biology, evolutionary genetics. I was curious about how a gene's position on a chromosome might determine its evolution. The reason is that genes that are very close to the centromere, they don't, so they tend to be at, these tend to be in the middle of the chromosome. Those areas don't recombine as much. So we thought that recombination might cause mutations. We thought that recombination might constrain the way that mutations are maintained in a population. So I was interested in that question. And I looked at that with two different genes, one of which um, was very close to the centromere and did all the things it was supposed to, one of which was very weird and, wasn't, and was further out from the centromere, but was associated with resistance to a disease resistance to a virus, in fact, in fruit flies. And so that work in my PhD, and that would have been like the 94 maybe, sat there in the back of my head spinning for a long time. And I started working on a different area of genetics, studying the structure of the Drosophila ovary, um, because it was interesting and it was related to the number of offspring they could produce. And so it was related to fitness. And it wasn't going to require me to do a lot of molecular biology, which by that time I'd grown to hate. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but this is, this is how a PhD is, right? So for my postdoc, I worked on that. And I was right back in the lab pipetting things away happily by the time I became a professor. And so from that work, we started studying the way that genes can cause changes either by their expression or by changes in the structure of the gene. Genes tend to make proteins. So if the protein is different, that's the kind of mutation we usually think about. But changes in expression are also really important. And sorry. <coughs> sorry for everyone I just deafened. Um, so if you look at men and women, for example, we think that we see many differences between men and women. But most of our genomes are the same, with the exception of the Y chromosome, which men have and women don't, which frankly doesn't contain a lot of genes. So if we look very different to one another, how can that be true? Well, the reason is that the genes are turned on and off. They are expressed in different ways. Um, so I became very interested in that question, studied that for a long time, and then finally got back into studying viruses in like 2008, probably. I started working on the same virus um, that caused the weird behavior in the gene I had studied for my doctorate. And from then I went on to, I did that for a long time and probably would still be doing it. Um, but I started studying the effects of the virus, um, the effect of the fly genome on the virus. And so that's very fun. So the fly genome has lots of ways to identify, just like ours does, identify viruses and knock them out. And there are particular mutational signatures of this. So the virus I was studying, it turned out had evolved a resistance of a sort. They had fewer of the types of types of changes in their sequence that were going to allow them to be mutated by the host genome. And so I worked on that for a while, and that led to studying Zika virus. And anyway, yeah, all over the place. That's the fun thing about science. I had an undergraduate ask me once, well, what are you going to do when you solve ovary number? Like, you don't, OK, in science, we don't solve things. We just create more questions. So you know that solving is ridiculous. And second of all, I'm, you know, I'll do that until I'm done with it, and then I'll think of something else to do. And so that's, that's a really fun part of being a scientist, is that you get to indulge your curiosity and explore new stuff. And there are always new questions, whether you stick to exactly the same thing or whether you sample around and pursue your curiosity, if you will. So, yeah. Great. Um, are there any, any further questions, anybody? <laughs> 
Um, well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Marta. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming.